Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 152. Today's guest is an Emmy nominated veteran actor of stage and screen. His prolific career includes Black Panther, The Wild Thornberries, The Green Mile, The Preacher's Wife, Beverly Hills, Nana to an L, Family Matters. And of course, he played the hospital security guard in the season six episode of Seinfeld, The Fusilli Jerry. Please welcome Jeff Coopwood. Jeff, thanks for joining. That was a hell of an introduction. You should follow me around. <laughs> uh, Jeff. I appreciate it. It was good talking to you. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show, Jeff. Believe it or not, it's been 28 years since the Fusilli Jerry. You look exactly the same, by the way. But yeah, I hoping you wouldn't have done the math because I did it myself earlier today. And I realized that that kid would be 28 years old today. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you for lying. Um, we'll make sure your optometrist knows that you have an issue. Uh, <laughs> so speaking uh, of it, so, so, so take us back, Jeff. So that, yeah, that 1995, wh- where right. were you in life? Where were you in your career? H- how did this role, obviously, Seinfeld Thursday night, it was uh, kicking on all cylinders. How did this role come about? Okay, let's see. Um, well, so you asked two separate questions, how I started and how I got the role. So. Um, I will spare you the, 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 the log cabin beginnings and uh, just jump right into how I got the gig. It was just a regular audition. Um, and what was interesting about it, as I recall, was I auditioned for a different episode and a different character altogether. And I booked the character that I auditioned for, which was a larger role. I had been in Los Angeles at the time. I moved out here in, in 92. Um, 1992. And at the time, uh, I moved from Chicago where I had already established myself. Um, I was actually a game show host on two television shows, uh, that were both syndicated on cable shooting out of Chicago. And then when I left both of those opportunities, uh, moved to Los Angeles, figured I would start all over again. I had been out here at that point about three years, I think. And I had done, um, I think the last thing I did um, in Chicago that wasn't the game shows was I did an episode of Brewster Place with Oprah, with Oprah Winfrey. I don't know if you remember that show or not. Um, It was based on, I think she had a movie and uh, the ABC gave her the show. So I did that. And then I came out here uh, to Los Angeles and I had done a three episode arc on the original Beverly Hills 90210, um, uh, which was great. And uh, had done some other things as well. And then Seinfeld came along and I auditioned uh, for it um, for a larger role in another episode. And I show up on set at the time that I was given and Larry David runs over to me um, because there's an actor that uh, that I remember auditioning with who's on set saying my lines. Wow. Not just beginning. So um, I run over, uh, no, Larry runs over and he's just, a, you know, he's apoplectic. He's apologetic. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, I have no idea what just happened. And he said, well, um, uh, I hired you for this role that you auditioned for. You were our first choice. Somehow or other, the signals got crossed with the casting director because she thought I meant to hire our second choice. And the problem is that she gave him an hour earlier call time. Then I gave you so that by the time I got on set, he was already in hair and makeup and wardrobe and was already on set doing lines. So oh. I was, what do you do? Right? So Larry said, but don't worry, don't worry. You're still going to get paid. You're still going to get your same rate. We, we just decided that since he was already here and they had already shot him, there's no sense in burning all that footage and bringing you in. But I want to use you. Um, but I, I, I will have to find another role for you. So he said, I'll give you a choice. You can either, um, wait until we write something for you in the next season, or since this was toward the end of this season, he said, we'll just plug you into the first available slot we have, regardless of what it is. And you'll make the same money that you would have made, you know, for the larger role that, 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 you know, we originally booked you for. So that's an interesting position to be put in. And, uh, you know, in Hollywood, even though I'd have been out here just three years, I learned, you know, bird in the hand, right? 
versus versus right, yeah, right. remember me next year. You're barely going to remember me next Tuesday, you know. So if you're offering me something that's sooner, um, this is not a time for me to focus on ego. I think the first thing you have, the money is going to be the same, and I'll be grateful for it. And so they called a few weeks later. Um, I did not forget, which to their credit, called a few weeks later. Um, uh, my agent said, you've got this role. They sent over the script and, uh, it was significantly smaller than the role that I had originally auditioned for. But I, again, the money was the same. And he said, so are you up for it? Do you want to take the smaller role? And normally under normal circumstances, you know, you wouldn't take a smaller role cause it's like sort of, once you go through a door, you don't want to go back. Um, but again, it was Seinfeld and it was Larry David. And this was the promise and the discussion we had had. So I had agreed to it. So I was in no position, you know, to say, no, nah, second thought, I wasn't going to do that. So so I took it. And as it turns out, and you guys would know this better than I would, but apparently the, the Fusilli Jerry episode is on, on, on a whole bunch of top 10 fans favorite lists. So it ended up being a great episode to be in, even in a smaller capacity. And and that's the long winded answer to a story. And I guess we're done now. Thanks for calling. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, I had to give you the backstory. Oh, wow, that's a heck of a story, though. I mean, and and you know, kudos to you for for doing like you said, burn the hand, and kudos for Larry. I guess at some point to kind of just say like, you know what, I was on me, and let's let's make this right, and kind of giving you the choice there, right? Um, well, no, he stand up about it, totally candid about it, and I yeah. respected him. Yeah. So. And and to your point, Fusilli is a favorite. A lot of it, you know, with Kramer and the ass man, you got you got uh, the Estelle, Estelle and Frank Estanza both in it. You got Putty's first episode. Um, right. So, yeah. T- so so take us through that. So your your scene, we were talking about it before you came on, me and Chris. It's just you can't I'll steal Chris's like you can't not smile watching that scene, watching you and how you and, and the K-Man there, you know, the old. OK, I got you. All right. It's just it's perfect. So however it worked out, you know, you were perfect for that role um, and that scene, you know, that's that's very generous of you. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, it was. Um, we shot it um, on the CBS Radford lot, which is where they shot. If you if I'm sure your other guests have probably referenced that over the years. And, uh, you know, it was an external scene. It was outside one of the production offices. They just painted a little stencil on it that said, you know, doctors only parking for the show. And then repainted over that after we were done with that with that scene. Um, what was interesting that I most remember about that scene was um, Larry's presence. Uh, Larry was there. The, the director of the scene, the director of the episode, um, as credited, it is Andy Ackerman. Right? Larry was the EP. He was the exec producer. In that particular scene, I can't speak for the rest of the episodes or, or the rest of the scenes, even in that episode. But in that particular scene, Larry directed it. And he just sat in the, in the director's chair and watched Larry work. Larry got up and he said, all right, I want this. I want that. OK, you know, he told, he told Kramer here, blah, 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 you know, and me, whatever. We did a few takes of it and, 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 and we were we were done. But it was fascinating just because, you know, it was the first time I'd actually seen an executive producer of the show actually directing it while the director is just sitting there, you know, and collecting a check, basically. And again, I'm quite sure that he directed other scenes in that episode, just like I'm sure he directed other episodes. But my singular experience in this one little scene was that that scene was directed by Larry David and not by, by Andy Ackerman. And if Andy calls me up tomorrow and tells me I'm in trouble. Nah, I mean, listen, it was it was Larry David's show. I mean, and he didn't he actually didn't write this episode. I mean, at the end of the day, he he rewrote a lot of stuff for sure, but he wasn't credited for writing this episode. Yeah, he. So, I mean, I think a lot, you know, when it was Tom Sharonis before him and then Ackerman, I think, you know, Larry was the lead. But you, I mean, your smile, I, I mean... <laughs> It's, it was one of the best smiles I've ever seen in TV. Just like, oh, okay. Like, th- how you did that, I don't know. It was just perfect. And like I said, just warms your heart watching that episode. So kudos Incredibly to you. To Thank you for that. But, no, so, yeah. Let's, uh, Larry's note, as I remember it, was, you know, uh, what usually if you park in a spot where you're not supposed to park and the security guard comes after you, he's a little bit belligerent, right? Got a little bit of an attitude. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to be here. You know, get a get your, but. but you know, I step in, a um, little bit of attitude at first, 
But then out he steps from the car and he points to the license plate. And the light and the course camera then gives you the close-up shot of the Aspen license plate. And he goes, proctologist. And they go, oh, ah, okay, well, surely this guy's <laughs> because who else in the mind walks you know, drives around with an ass man license plate. So, you know, that 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 was and at that point it was like, all right, you've established you're legit. I, I believe you, you have cred now, have a nice day. So that's what it was. So but now a, a, a true hospital security guard should know in New York the license plate needs to say MD on there, but uh really? not necessarily. You may true, get a, yeah. you may get a parking sticker in the window, but how many doctors in MD are in, in, in New York are driving around with MD on their plates? That's an invitation for theft. <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> they'll, they'll go off the wheels in a heartbeat. Are you kidding me? You don't advertise. So yeah, true. Take, Particularly if you're a poor slub of an intern, you know, or, or or a resident and you're driving a hoopty. The last thing you're going to do is throw MD on the back of that bad boy. You yeah. know, MD on the back of a Nova really doesn't impress a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so, Jeff, yeah. You, yeah. you mentioned you, you tried out for the – what was the original role that you were supposed to get? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, I'm going to take the fifth. Oh, well, let me ask you this. Was it a uh, – well, let me tell you why I'm going to take the fifth. Yeah. Because of about this. Um, the reason I'm going to take the fifth is I'm going to take the fifth out of respect to the actor that booked it. Okay. Because the last thing I want to do now, 28 years after the fact, is tell some dude, oh, you know, you were the second choice on this gig, and you only got it because of a mix-up. I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me, you know? And I'm not about to, like, throw somebody else under the bus like that, too. So I'm going to keep that information to myself, just out of respect for the other talent. That's all. Well, good Good answer. Good answer, and you know how to ask, so I respect (laughs) that. Oh, of course. And I thought about it myself. I was like, oh, wow, because I really want to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) you We can assume, though, it was the same season, though, right? Because you mentioned you didn't want to go back, right? So it was within that. It was pretty close. It was the same season, at least. So you 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 knew to like, hey, if they got me something coming up, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to wait till the following season. So, um, well, you know. I can tell you is the reason I did that is because it was toward the end of my season. Yes. Yeah. Facility Jerry was the third, well, the fourth to last that aired anyway. I don't know when it was shot, but it was definitely towards the end of the season. Yeah. Well, I do. You guys are the pros. But yeah, and it was, and again, you know, if somebody wants to, to go back and, you know, do some forensic reconstruction, <laughs> I can simply tell you that it was several weeks um, after my original uh, episode aired, but it was the same season. And as you know, mine was toward the end of the year. So it was somewhere in the middle. That's about all I could tell you. <laughs> Fair probably, enough. You know, otherwise I probably would not have expected, you know, the opportunity for them to say, all right, well, you know, would you come back, you know, before the end of the season? So that was, that was, that was why I did it. Yeah, that's when fair. We, and that's respectful. Toward the end of the season. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's fair. And, and it's interesting. If you can figure out. <laughs> it's interesting because it sounds like from what you're saying and, and you can tell us, but this is season six of Seinfeld, right? So they were already, they were peak. You know, we like to say season five is probably peak, um, but season six is right, you know, four, five, six. Um, so uh, assuming you were a fan of the show before you got that role, is that is that fair to say? Were you kind of, was it on your radar? I mean, was it something where it was like, you know, I got to get on this show or is it just, you know, a fan from afar, that type of thing? I'll be honest with you. Um, any show that's in the top 10, an actor wants to be on right, right. visibility. Right. Um, and, and, and what I did at the time was I made a point to try to catch at least one episode of all of the major shows that I potentially would be able to audition for today. You couldn't do that because of cable. There's a million channels. Back then, of course, you know, you had your network and you had cable, but you didn't have the mass proliferation that you have now. So um, because, you know, as you're auditioning for the work, every every show has its own you know, style, has its own pace, you know, has its own feel. And so when you go into an audition, you want to be prepared. So you want to have seen at least an episode or two before you audition. And of course, Seinfeld was unavoidable because we all know, you know, it was a highly rated show. So, yeah, I wanted to, to be on the show, to be quite honest, not so much because I was a fan, 
but because I was an actor who wanted to be on a high profile show to increase my own visibility. Now that's an honest answer. So yeah, that um, makes sense. You know, it was a, it was a business decision because I treat the business like it is a business. And so, you know, I try to put my fandom aside and put that compartmentalized into like a different section of the stuff that I personally watch versus the stuff that it would be in my best interest to try to be a part of. So that's kind of sort of where, 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 where I was with that at the time. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned Larry a few times, and I know you mentioned you're on the rad for a lot. Was there any other interest? I mean, this is a great show. You had This is the first show with uh, Putty, obviously. You had the whole right. Last Man thing. B- b- uh, uh, George's parents were b- both in this. I mean, a really a, a packed show of guest stars, obviously, you mm-hmm. highlighting that. But w- what do you remember about being on that set? Obviously, season six, Larry, Jerry, like, how was it different from any other show you've been a part of? Um, it was different because I was only in the one scene. And I was only in the one scene with one other actor. So, so you, didn't, you didn't hang around and watch all the whole episode the whole week? Or how'd that work? I was, I was, I was paid for the week, but obviously it didn't take a week to shoot my, my scene. So um, I had brief interactions uh with jerry i think it was the extent of like almost like hello you know um uh a brief interaction um you know with the actor who played elaine obviously um and that's unfortunate because i wish that there had been more because she's a northwestern alum and i'm a chicago guy so we have a lot of friends in common but that opportunity just did not present itself and the last thing you do on set if you're professional is once your job is wrapped you stick around and you don't know when to leave and you hang around and you get in the way because people are working. So as much as I would have loved the opportunity to have a sit down and a good chat with everybody, the opportunity didn't organically present itself. And once my done was once, once my business was done and I was wrapped, it was just time to leave. I will say, however, that I was lucky enough to be in the makeup chair, makeup and wardrobe chair sitting next to Jason Alexander. Oh, nice. And, and I got to tell you that we spent probably the better part of over an hour just jawboning in the makeup chair and neither one of us needed a lot of makeup you know um um and i could make it take a shot and say he didn't need a lot of hair but um you know (laughs) and but listen that's a shot that he's heard before so i'm not the first to say that um and we've subsequently subsequently run into each other several times uh out here um because he's very active in the los angeles theater community as am i And we've got tons of mutual friends. I literally just saw a show that he directed here just last month that starred one of my college classmates. Um, And it's a wonderful production. So, uh, and he and I have worked um, at the same theater, not at the same time, but so our paths cross regularly, semi-regularly, I should say. Um, You you a hurricane? You're a hurricane, right, Jeff? Absolutely, unapologetically. You know that. You, what? You've, been re- you've been reading Wikipedia again. You you know you have. I well, no, that. you mentioned Chicago. I know you spent a lot of time in Miami, and I like you know, you've touched on respect a lot, and I have to imagine you got that from your parents. Um, um, and obviously, you, you, your parents played a big role in in what you became, right, as an actor. Well, both of my parents were radio broadcasters. Um, so I guess I came by our respect for. Uh, Leo broadcasting acting came through, you know, all of that organically. And, and one of the things that you learn early on, um, when you're working with professionals is to be a professional, you know, if you don't, if, if you don't treat the craft with respect, you won't be doing it very well, very long. So I've always treated it with the respect that I think it deserves. In fact, one of my pet peeves are the folks who don't treat it with the respect that it deserves or the folks who don't realize that it's a craft, you know, that you don't just roll out of bed one day and decide, gee, I think I want to be an actor. And then by noon, you're calling yourself an actor. That's a pet peeve of mine. I'm like, you don't roll out of bed one day and decide you want to be a doctor. And by, by, by lunchtime, you're in surgery, you know, you don't roll out of bed one day and say, you want to be a lawyer and you're arguing cases before the Supreme court by the end of the day. It's a, it's a process and it's a craft and you never master it. It's just like, you know, doctors and, and, and lawyers, don't don't say that they have practices. They are practicing their craft. They never perfect it, and and I never perfect mine. So it's an ongoing process. But I give it the respect 
that 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 it deserves because if you don't you don't get the longevity that you want you know both of us all three of us can name folks who were hot for five minutes and then after that opportunity disappeared you never heard from them again right but here we are 28 years after my little walk on on seinfeld and i'm still plugging along here so you know i i, I like to say that i've not only paid my dues, but I respected the craft in the process. So I'm still here. And that's, that's <laughs> the reward. Yeah, that's commendable. And uh, it shows. Uh, and just talking to you right now, we, we get a sense of that, too. Um, and you mentioned the, the, the theater work you're doing. Um, and obviously, we know you from, from TV and film. I, I also, I mean, you, you, you broadcast, like you said, voiceover uh, opera singer. Is that right? I mean, you, you kind of yeah. cover the whole gamut of, of performing there. And uh, it's clear that you kind of hone those crafts each individually and, and, and probably throughout your career, kind of, like you said, picking and choosing where you're going to kind of land each time but in your mind what is your um kind of uh what what are some of the ones that you kind of a highlight of your career as far as all of that goes whether it's the the opera or, or the television or the theater like wh where do you kind of hang your hat and say you know that was something i'm proud of or something like that that's a really interesting question um you know the one thing that i try to avoid doing is um picking my favorite children because they're all my kids, right. you know, and and the, the experiences that are the most enjoyable and the most memorable are made so oftentimes not necessarily because of the work, although sometimes the work is more fun and challenging and interesting and entertaining to do than other times. But it's often because of the people that you work with, you know, and those those interactions that you have on a personal level with folk while you're doing the work. Those are kind of special. Um, so so like I'll never forget. Um, being on stage singing with Pavarotti, you know, you're not going to forget that. Um, right. There's even a funny story that I tell my friends about that opportunity that no, I will not broadcast, but <laughs> over just one of these days, I will tell you that story and you'll understand why it's a very funny story to tell and not a story that I'm going to broadcast. It's interesting too. You mentioned Pavarotti. There's a Seinfeld connection with Pavarotti. There's a Seinfeld connection with PBS Pledge Drive, which you've also, I know, hosted a lot of. All right, so Jeff, you you mentioned you mentioned Oprah, you mentioned Pavarotti. Uh, who else we got on this list? But actually, Muhammad Ali, you, Ray Charles, you, right? So you were, you were brought, you were in Chicago. Were you doing broadcasting like with Lester Holt and, and him, or like? I knew Lester. I knew Lester. Lester was um, Lester. Wow, you guys really did your homework. Lester was uh, here. I'm trying to fix this light at the same time. Um, bear with me here. All right. Perfect. Oh, that's perfect. Um, yeah, yeah. So Lester was the CBS anchor uh, in the Chicago affiliate WB WBBM TV at the time that I was there. So um, I'm not going to say we were buddies. Mm. I knew who he was. <laughs> we met, I think, briefly at uh, the local Emmy Awards. So uh, I was nominated. I, I assume he was. We met and said a brief hello. Um, we didn't know each other as well as I knew some of the other anchors that were on that on, the, on that station, and some of the folks that were on um, uh, other stations as well. And in fact, two of the people who became anchors here in Los Angeles subsequently years later are folks who I knew from Chicago. So there's that. Um, but yeah, yeah, the Jeff. The the Chicago connection is is incredible, especially on Seinfeld. Right? Like, you strange. mentioned Julia. I mean, the guest stars Mike Haggerty, John Capolis, Pat Finn. We go on and on. I mean, right, right, right. You know, and 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 you know, uh, it, it it's a bit of a small fraternity. You know, at yeah. some point, the longer you've been at it, the more people you're going to run into that you know, or uh, uh, one degree of separation. You know that you know, but that you have friends that who know. You know, so so that that's kind of common. And you were talking about before, like Oprah, Oprah and I go way back and 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 Pavarotti became a friend. And I mean, my dad, if you if you really did some digging, you discover my dad is credited um, for helping to discover the Jackson, Jackson five, five yeah. you know, so there's that. Um you know, I have amazing memories and I don't know how you mentioned Ray Charles. I thought, and I was like, how do you know about the Ray Charles thing? I actually had an opportunity as a kid because my mother was a broadcaster, as I said, where I got to sit on Ray Charles's lap at like a 10 year, at like 10 or 11 years old. 
and have him say, do you mind if I touch your face so I can see what you look like? I mean, you know, I have memories like that. I have memories of watching Ike and Tina Turner backstage in the wings while they were doing Proud Mary on the stage. I have memories of having breakfast in bed with Gladys Knight, you know, um, which I should say also I was an 11-year-old while my mother was interviewing her in her hotel room and uh, she was getting breakfast. And, and, and so I have that memory. I have memories of uh, Muhammad Ali when he was training. I got all kinds of crazy memories. So, so ah. when, when if I ever get around to writing that, 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 that memoir, I can just name drop my face off. I'll be honest. I've, it's been an, it's been a, it's been a fascinating, remarkable ride. And I'm very lucky and very blessed and very grateful. So and it's not over yet. Hey, I'm just glad we're in comp. We're in that same company with Oprah yeah, now. Larry we're David. talking to you. <laughs> it's not yeah, you yeah. mentioned yeah i mean i would be, got into, uh, one, one less degree of uh separation now that's right you should uh is there any, any ever audition for for curb what uh what the, it sounded like liar really took to you i mean as far as you know taking you on that first gig and then bringing you back right. and then uh, direct the directing larry's story is great just to know that he had his hands on everything i'm just uh you know you never know curb is still going you know um, I have not had that opportunity, but you never know. Like you said, it's still going. Um, and it's a small town. Uh, so who knows? We'll see. You know, I've got, I've got that. Um, I was doing, um, someone had asked me before, not about, not about Curb and Larry, but you probably also, since you guys have done your homework on me, at least, um, you probably know my Star Trek connection and my Star Wars connections as well. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You know, uh, the resist resistance is futile. That thing is me, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, people have also said the same thing. It's like, well, you did the voice in the film, you know, the voice of the Borg thing. Are you going to do any of the Star Trek spinoffs? And I'm like, listen, everybody's got my ages number. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, you're not I'm, saying I'm, no, I'm, right? I'm not turning down a whole bunch of work. So right, right. I'm still plugging at it. So I figure... You know, there's, there's all, there are all kinds of opportunities that are still out there. So it's just a matter of time. Hopefully we'll yeah. see. Yeah. And Maybe then, yeah. Come back and, and, and do your show again. Yeah. Let's do it. Hey, Jeff, I, I know you, you bounce between both towns and I, I, you mentioned hurricane, you more of a Miami or Chicago guy. See, that's funny. Cause like I said, it's like picking my kids. Um, I was born in Chicago, lived in Chicago until we were, I was seven. Uh, then moved to, uh, Beaumont for a year in Texas. My mother, uh, my, my folks, you know, amicably divorced. If there is such a thing as an amicable divorce, you know, when I was young, um, uh, and as I said, they were both radio people. Uh, she became the custodial parent as was customary back then. You automatically went with, you know, with a mom and, uh, she got a radio opportunity at, at, a, at a station in, uh, Texas for a year which she took out of Chicago. Then she got two other opportunities a year later. One was to go to Los Angeles and one was to go to Miami. And so I'm eight at the time. And she says, all right, so here's, so we had a little dinner, dinner table conversation. She said, uh, where would you like to go next? Miami or Los Angeles? And I said, let's go to Los Angeles. And she said, great. Cause we're going to Miami. Um, <laughs> you know, at, at eight, you get to vote, but your vote doesn't count. So, you know, that's how that went. And we went to, to, to Miami and uh, it ended up being a, a tremendous uh, opportunity for me. Um, um, uh, it was in a, a tremendous opportunity for her. Um, I could do a whole bunch more name drop in there, you know, um, but I'm mercifully not going to do that to you. Um, but it was great. And from third grade through college, I was a Miami guy. So that's where I did college. That's where I, the hurricane thing come from. But now yeah, that you mentioned the hurricane thing, where did you go? Because now clearly there's something there I should find out. Not, about. I, we just we we always like to interweave a little sports in. So who who's yeah. your favorite uh, who, who's your favorite Miami hurricane ever? Wow, you should warn me. You should warn <laughs> me. You throw that out there. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I don't have Make one. It. Sap, Michael Irvin, we think. Er, yeah, Irvin would, here's, yeah. what I, here's what I have. I got a funny, I got. Vinny, I got, we love Vinny up here. Well, I was, Vinny, I'm not mad at. Vinny, I think was, well, Vinny was after me. I'll tell you who was there when I was there. Uh, Jim Kelly was there when I was there. 
OJ Anderson was there when I was there. Okay, that's just some ah, yeah, yeah, MVP, yeah. OJ is, yeah. And and of course the coaches Howard Schnellenberger was there when I was there. Yeah. Um, and if you're a pro football guy, I can tell you that the Dolphins won the back-to-back Super Bowls in 71 and 72 when I was there. Uh, and my mother, being a broadcaster back then, she also became a, a newspaper and a magazine publisher. Uh, I got to know all of those Dolphins because – uh, she did a special edition of her magazine on the Dolphins, and I got to know them all personally. I got wow. to know uh, Mercury Morris Zonka. And, and Larry Zonka and Paul Warfield and Bob Greasy. I mean, I've, I'm in their homes, playing with their kids, playing with their dogs, you know, um, having dinner at their homes. You know, Gary Upremian, the famous kicker guy, um, you know, um, he and his wife, Maritza, got to know them which actually came up in a recent conversation because uh, since we're talking sports, I've got a, I've got a Super Bowl ad running right now. I don't know if you guys have caught it or not. No. I don't know if you caught it in your, in your, in your research, but uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously you know who Gronk is. Yeah. And you know who Adam Vinatieri is. They, yeah. they, we've got a, they've got a fan duel campaign going on right now. Yeah. Him kicking the, yeah. Kicking the thing. I'm in those commercials, my man. All right. Yeah. Go well, back and look at those commercials. I was one of the coach slash scientists who's getting him prepped for uh, for that big kick. So if you go back and you see that commercial, I'm prominent in that commercial. It's yeah, he's he's like training yeah. like the Russian in Rocky IV. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's and and the guy that's sitting there yelling kick harder, harder. That's me. <laughs> so, nice. So if you go back and you look at that commercial. Um, you'll see, you'll see me prominently there. And it was fun talking about my Miami days and my dolphin days with Adam Vinatieri, because obviously he's a kicker and obviously he remembered, you know, very well remembered Gary, your premium they, yeah. they, they from the famous, you know, not only from the super bowls, but the guy that tried to throw the pass. If you remember the famous fumble, he fumbled the ball, uh, uh the bat snap, he ran he, instead of trying to kick the ball, he tried to throw the ball. He did one of those things where his hand went forward and the ball went backward, and it was a disaster. Yeah, so, that's not all those follies, that famous yeah, – uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One those, it's one of those, you know, blooper reel moments that yeah. follow you around forever, just like the Hail Mary pass follows Boston, you know, Boston College versus Miami. Flutie, that's my favorite uh, clip of all time, Flutie, that Flutie throw. Yeah, I'm not that much of a fan of it. <laughs> um, I don't know, Bernie Kozar years, yeah. I'm not a fan of that. Well, like if Bernie was after me, you know. Not a fan of that. Not a not a fan of Catholics versus convicts with Notre Dame. Uh, not not a fan of that. Um, but um, as I said, Jim Kelly was a was a year below me when I was there, um, and and he was the quintessential. He was like the um, the the Lawrence of his day. Shoulder length hair, uh, tank top, shorts, flip flops, you know, chick magnet. So um, and and as I said, I have. I have a favorite story that I can tell but won't tell publicly. So maybe later. <laughs> we, we got a lot, <laughs> we got a lot for of that stories. memoir. That memoir is going to be great, Jeff. <laughs> Listen, I have friends who, honest to God, tell me, who know some of these stories, right? And so they say, Jeff, you should write a book. And I say, the only time I can write this book is when I am formally retired and living in a place that does not extradite. Um, <laughs> and the title of the book will basically be, which I can't even say, can you swear on your podcast or no? Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's the expletive spot. All right. So, so just, and it's not that bad, but really every, my, my friends who joke about all of the stories that I have, the people that I know and the anecdotes that I've seen, they're like, the name of your book, Jeff should be, you may not remember this, but I know all your shit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the name of the book. Cause I know some stuff, you know, That's great. Which is, again, after a 30 plus year, 40 year career doing this crazy stuff, if you don't have some crazy stories, then you weren't there, you know? So I got a lot of stuff that I could stuff. Just like I'm sure somebody's got stuff on me that, you know, I have to always have enough money to bribe people if necessary. So, yeah, you know, well, just like I'm sure the folks that know you guys really well have got some dirt on you. So uh, it goes both ways. We're clean, Jeff. We're clean. But hey, clean I got to tell you. Group, right. This is just the question is who's doing the driving. Come on. Yeah. Now. <laughs> that old joke. Jeff, this is uh, this has been an absolute pleasure, man. I mean, you were you salt of the earth. The, 
you've entertained us for so many years and I hope you continue to entertain us. It's so funny. Can't wait to watch, rewatch that commercial, uh, the yeah. ground commercial, but, um, yeah, you know, was cool yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, man, listen from Seinfeld to Muhammad Ali, you've, re you've, you've, you've touched it all. So thanks so much. Well, you guys have been awesome. And I didn't even tell you the Muhammad Ali story, which I can, unless you I want to wrap it up. Yeah, let's hear oh, it. Of course. Always an Ali story. This is a story that I can actually tell. All right. So, and then this will be the, this will be my farewell for you. <laughs> hopefully, it'll worth, worth, hopefully it'll be worth your time. So I want to say I, this was back in the Miami years and, and Muhammad Ali, formerly Cassius Clay, as you know, trained out of Miami, out of a gym in Miami. I want to say it was the eighth street or sixth street gym or something, but it was a famous gym. And, um, my mother being a broadcaster, um, and a publisher, uh, went and, and did him, uh, did an interview of him, I should say. Did an interview, didn't do him, did an interview. Anyway, so um and there's a moment where you remember the movie, the Ali movie, the biopic that Norma Jewison directed? Any either of you guys remember that? Yeah, yeah. Like a three hour epic and Will Smith yeah, played Will Ali. Smith. Yeah. yeah. So um there's a scene in that, and it was a super long film. There's a scene in there where they referenced the fact that Ali tried to start a burger chain at one time. And it was going to be called Champ Burger. And like Fat Burger out here, if you're familiar with them. So it was going yeah. to be Champ Burger. And Champ Burger was something that I had completely forgotten about um, until the movie came out and they actually referenced it. And the reason it was important to me was, you know, as I said, my mother had gone to interview him, uh, interview Ali one day. Um, and it was right about the time that he was opening up the first Champ Burger. And it was like literally the week before the grand opening. And so she was, you know, he was doing pre-press, right? Pre-opening press. And um, she had her photographer there. He had his photographer there. I was all of 10 or 11. I was there. Uh, pretty much it was just the four of us. Um, and at one, or somebody was in the kitchen, I think. And at one point he looked, to, to, looked at me, turned over and said, you look hungry. Uh, would you like a burger? And I'm not going to do my Ali impression because it's super bad. But would you like a burger, you know? And 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 I'm like, yeah, sure. We've it's been busy. I haven't had anything to eat. He made this boy a burger. So uh, he 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 made he had his his chef guy uh, make a burger for me. And I mean, this guy loaded it up with every imaginable condiment. Right? You had your mayo, your mustard, your ketchup, your chopped onions, the whole shebang. Right? And I devoured this thing like a kid, like a ten year old kid does. I mean, I got. I got condiments just dribbling everywhere, all over my face and my face. It's just dribbling sauce and mayo and mustard or whatever. <laughs> and he looks over and he goes, that's it. That's it. That's the face of my burger chain. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells his photographer, take a picture. That face, that's going to sell me a lot of burgers. That's the face of my burger chain. So the photographer goes to take my picture with the face slathered in every condiment, right? And my mother, who I should point out to you, had was not only a broadcaster, but had also been a model and was uh, one of the first uh, African-American graduates of the John Robert Powers Modeling Academy back in the day, mm. um, was like, oh, no, no, no. No son of mine will ever have a photo taken where he's messed with the juice and the make it, wipe it, wipe your face, Jeffrey, wipe your face. And you know, I was in trouble because it was Jeffrey, right? So, you know, <laughs> Jeffrey, Jeffrey, you know, you know, mothers will find your full name when they want to. Oh, get yeah. So they, Jeffrey, wipe your face. And, and, and there was this entire conversation that I had with Muhammad Ali, which was silent because neither one of us said a word, but the entire conversation was with eye contact alone. And I looked up at him when my mother said, wipe my face. And he looked over at me and the conversation was, son, if you wipe your face, you're ruining the shot. And we will take the picture when you are no longer going to be the face of my burger chain. And I looked back at him and this was all in a look, right? And I looked back at him and, and my look to him was, yeah, I know, but that's my mother. What am I going to do? So I'm wiping the face <laughs> and he's looking at me and he's giving me the look going. And my burger chain fandom died right there. <laughs> oh, man. I could have been the face of Champ Burger, but my mother made me wipe my mouth. So now you have a story about you, me and Muhammad Ali. Well, so, you guys, you had it. You had it. You we spoke. had it. You know, could have been something. Sadly, the chain did not survive. 
So in the grand scheme of things, it's not like I would have ever retired off of that check, but it would have been a really cool thing to have been able to add to the resume. Well, and hey, I listen. The youthful face of Champ Burger with Muhammad Ali. And there mother, you go. Listen, from the, from, the, from the greatest to one of our greatest guests already, Jeff Coop oh, with everybody. All right, it's official. Your check's in the mail. Thank you so much. <laughs> but, Jeff, uh, no, thanks no, so no. much. Listen, you guys have been awesome. I appreciate your patience with the craziness of getting this set up and everything. So I hope it was worth the effort. Definitely, you, Jeff. This was awesome. Thank you so much, man. We really enjoyed awesome. it. Thank you, guys. Take care. Stay well. God bless. Right. Hopefully Thank we'll talk too. again soon. Be well. Right. Cheers. Bye-bye.